Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. New at 5, when seconds mattered, they waited. The officers had weapons, the children had none. The officers had body armor, the children had none. The officers in Uvalde were on scene three minutes after shots were fired, but didn't enter that classroom until an hour later. Kellogg's is making a big change. What does that mean for the Michigan community known as Serial City? And the Crumblies putting the prosecutor on blast. Why they say she's gone too far. But we begin Local 4 News at 5 with a weather alert, a heat advisory in effect for all of Metro Detroit. You see right that it's 95 degrees right now in Detroit. The high heat has arrived as promised and going to take a little while before it moves out. So let's start things off at 5 with Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hey there, Kimberly and Devin. Simply sizzling out there with temps in the 90s, even as the sun sets and shortly afterward. Heat advisory is up until 8 o'clock in the evening for Detroit and all of southeast Michigan, most of the lower peninsula. It's 97 at City Airport, 96 now over in Pontiac. And yes, at this minute, the temperature just changed a few moments ago. It is now 96 degrees at Metro Airport. We have tied the record set back in 1933. On top of that, it's humid out there, so it feels like 100 or greater. So still, if you are venturing outside, stay hydrated with water, limit your physical activity outdoors, stay in or near air conditioned areas if you can. 96 right now over at Metro with a wind out of the west at around 14 miles per hour, and we continue to swelter with that high humidity as we go through the 11 o'clock hour. These are the heat indices or feels like temperatures through much of the night tonight. You can see it feels like it's in the 80s even when you join us tonight at 11 and shortly afterward. So is there any relief in sight? We'll talk about tomorrow's forecast, the rest of your week's forecast in minutes. Hey, Andrew, thank you. Two drivers are dead after an early morning crash on I-94 in Taylor. Sky 4 over the massive backup in the westbound lanes at Beach Daily. State police say a pickup truck was hit by a car, and that led to the truck hitting a semi. They say the car and pickup truck caught fire in a ditch. Both drivers were taken to the hospital, and they both died from their severe burns. The semi truck driver was not hurt. Uh, the freeway, by the way, has since reopened. Our other top story here at five, abject failure. That's what the head of the Texas Department of Public Safety is calling the police response to the school shooting in Uvalde. That comes after it emerged officers were inside Robb Elementary and could have confronted the gunman three minutes after the shooting started. And questions mounting about the man in charge of that response. Jay Gray is following that story for us tonight. Jay. I'd like to observe a moment of silence. A silence broken. 1131, the suspect begins shooting at the school. By a stunning review of the timeline in the deadly attack. Three minutes after the subject entered the West Building, there was sufficient number of armed officers wearing body armor to isolate, distract, and neutralize the subject. Three minutes in, nine officers with pistols and rifles gathered in the school hallway. This still image from surveillance video appears to show multiple officers with weapons and a ballistic shield huddled together 19 minutes after the killing spree began, still waiting outside classrooms as shots were being fired. One error, 14 minutes and eight seconds. That's how long the children waited and the teachers waited in rooms 111 to be rescued. The director of the Texas Department of Public Safety during hours of testimony to state senators outlining a response he describes as an abject failure. And terrible decisions were made by the on-scene commander and should have never happened, plain and simple. That on-scene commander, Uvalde School Police Chief Pete Arandondo, repeatedly telling officers to wait on more backup, weapons, shields, and keys to classrooms that were already unlocked as the attack played out. Aaron Dondo has refused to speak publicly about the investigation into his department's actions. Members of a separate House committee did question the chief behind closed doors today in Austin. Jay Gray, Local 4. And today's hearing was the first time in close to a month that officials spoke publicly about the shooting investigation. Now to day four of the public hearing surrounding the attack on the U.S. Capitol. Today we heard emotional testimony from election officials in several states and a Georgia poll worker all saying they've been harassed and threatened. The committee says it was all part of former President Trump's failed attempts to stay in power. Let's get to Bree Jackson in Washington with more. Bree. 
The January 6th committee focused on what it calls a failed pressure campaign to force state officials to overturn their election results with testimony from Republicans in two key battleground states, Georgia and Arizona. The January 6th committee outlining an elaborate effort to overturn 2020 election results on the state level. Pressuring public servants into betraying their oaths was a fundamental part of the playbook. This pressure campaign brought angry phone calls and texts, armed protests, intimidation, and all too often threats of violence and death. Stop the steal! Laying out video evidence showing protest against local election officials and hearing testimony honing in on the now infamous phone call between former President Trump and Georgia's Republican Secretary of State. I just want to find uh, 11,000. 780 votes. Earlier in the day, Trump took to social media defending himself, describing that phone call as perfect. We didn't have any votes to find. And later claiming Arizona's House Speaker, a Republican, agreed the election was rigged. Anywhere, anyone, anytime has said that I said the election was rigged, that would not be true. The committee also highlighting a failed scheme to send a false slate of pro-Trump electors to Washington. Don't be distracted by politics. This is serious. We cannot let America become a nation of conspiracy theories and thug violence. Committee members say it was those false claims and failed attempts to overturn election results that turned into a call to action for Trump's supporters to storm the Capitol. The next public hearing is scheduled for Thursday. It's expected to focus on efforts to pressure top Justice Department officials to investigate false claims of widespread voter fraud. In Washington, I'm Bree Jackson for Local 4 News. All right, Bree, ahead here at 6 o'clock, we're going to take a look at the major role Michigan played in today's hearings, including what State Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky says happened after President Trump tweeted out his personal cell phone number. That's at 6. Uh, now, next year at 5, in a new court filing, lawyers for James and Jennifer Crumbly say Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald has crossed the line. That's right. They say McDonald continues to badmouth their clients in the media and are tainting the potential jury pool. So let's bring in Priya Mann. She's live tonight. Priya, they say she should be punished for this, too. Yeah, that's right, Kim and Devin. You know, this is part of a back and forth between the prosecution and the defense. This is the brief and motion that was filed today. Essentially, the defense is asking a judge to step in, saying their clients can't get a fair trial. Lawyers representing James and Jennifer Crumbly filed an emergency supplemental motion on Tuesday, asking the Sixth Circuit Court to restrict pretrial publicity and calling for sanctions, specifically for comments made by Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald. In the motion, the defense writes, the prosecution continuously putting absolutely false information in the public purview and doubling down on the misinformation when called out is what will cause the Crumblies to be deprived of a fair trial. They go on to say, the public has been saturated with facts from the prosecution that they cannot and will not prove, such as the gun being unlocked and Ethan Crumbly having free access to it. Ms. McDonald is clearly using the prestige of her position to assert that the defense is not truthful. This cannot continue. In response, Prosecutor McDonald's office released this statement saying, our team is focused on preparing for trial and looks forward to presenting all the evidence at the proper time in court. James and Jennifer's son, Ethan Crumbly, is accused of killing four students at Oxford High School last November. The mass shooting garnered significant national attention, as did the search for the parents once they were charged with involuntary manslaughter. The defense writes, due to the repeated violations of pretrial publicity rules, the defense asks that the prosecution be sanctioned in a way this court deems fair, just, and equitable. And Jennifer and James Crumbly are actually back in court next week on this very same issue, asking a judge for a change of venue, saying they won't get a fair trial here. Of course, Local 4 will be there and update you as soon as we hear more. Reporting live tonight, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. Priya, before you go, there's also some news about Ethan Crumbly. What do you know about that? Yeah, that's right. He will be appearing virtually in court on Thursday. This is a monthly hearing that he's been having every month since his arrest to see whether he should remain at the Oakland County Jail. Of course, we will continue to update you on that development as well. We will. Okay, Priya, thanks. The Detroit City Council agrees to postpone a vote on a tax break for Dan Gilbert's latest 
bedrock project. The $60 million tax break would go to the project on the site of the former Hudson's department store. There's a proposal on the table to give bedrock $6 million in tax savings for the next 10 years. The vote has been delayed by another week. Construction of the project is expected to finish in 2024, about two years behind schedule. A man is in custody after a barricaded situation on Detroit's west side. It was about 9 o'clock this morning on Bentler Street near West McNichols. Police say city workers were cutting grass at a vacant lot when a homeowner on Westbrook Street asked them to not cut his garden. They say the man went into his house and came back out with several guns. He went on to barricading himself inside. We're told the man did come out of the home about two hours later and was taken into custody. We are getting an update tonight on the investigation into a spill in the Flint River. Booms in the river have been lifted as the cleanup continues after last week's spill. Crews have identified 10 hard sites that were affected by the contaminants. So far, nine of the 10 have been cleaned, but a no contact order remains in place while testing is being conducted. There is hope that that order can be lifted by the end of this week. Meanwhile, the substance in the river has yet to be identified. We're identifying the breach, which has still not yet been done. We know the location, we have it pinpointed, but this is a site that has had decades and decades and decades of industry on that exact piece of land. So to dig down, we have to do it meticulously, and I think that it was described best as, as like an autopsy of the dirt to get down to that container. So it's gonna take a little bit of time for that. An order to cease operations was issued today to Lockhart Chemical Company. A slight decrease in the state's gas prices, but prices are still above $5 a gallon. Statewide average for a gallon of gas is currently at $5.14 a gallon, down one cent from yesterday. One week ago, a gallon of gas was going for about $5.21 a gallon. Here in Metro Detroit, a gallon of gas will cost you $5.24. Governor Whitmer calling on President Biden to work with Congress to temporarily pause the federal gas tax. You may recall the governor proposed or opposed a plan uh, proposed for the gas tax holiday across the state. We'll keep you posted on where it heads, of course. Off and running on a busy Tuesday. That we are. Let's check in with Sean Lang.